So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 6. Uh, you know, as we're, as we're turning there, I'm reminded of, you know, some painful situations people are facing. Uh, we've had a number of people in our church face some serious illness, and God has answered powerfully. Uh, my own pastor's wife is ready to meet Jesus. She's fought a long battle. Uh, even in her later stages, before she, why she could barely do anything, she was still serving at the pastor's conference this fall. And, uh, but it looks like she's going to be with the Lord, and I'm praying the Lord bring her home with great rejoicing in her labors for many, many years. And uh, we're all going to be together again. That's the hope we have in the Lord. Amen? All right, John chapter 6. Now, John 5 if you wanted to answer anybody's question about Jesus, like who is Jesus? John 5, he answers it powerfully. Uh, as he even looks at his, the very honor of, you know, that you're to give the son, John 5, 23, Jesus summed it up by saying that all should honor the son as they honor the father. Think about what that means. If I said to you, you should honor me as you honor God, I hope every one of you get up and leave because that's crazy. Who can say that? Well, the Son of God can. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This is the one we worship. He came so, from so high to reach us. He became a man. His love demonstrated eventually on the cross. So at this point, John is, ex is ex describing through the very miracles, the signs that Jesus did, that you could believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so now he's going to show two more signs in John 6 to prove this. Um, I, I love that. That's a very powerful thing. You know, if, if, you, if I were to write a book and tell you that you should trust this is of God, you'd have every right to say, prove it. You know, that's what the Bible actually does. When God speaks... He speaks in a way that you know no man could have done it. All the prophecies, uh, all of the, the accuracy that can be tested in history. There is nothing, there is no book like the Bible. The Quran doesn't even hold a candle to the Bible. Uh, the Quran was written many, many years after the supposed events of Muhammad. We don't really know. In fact, the final version of the Quran that they finally settled on in Saudi Arabia as the final word, okay, of the 30 versions they had, this is the one we're going to accept, wasn't until 1985. I'm older than the Quran. How do you know whether or not everything that's written in there has any verification in any historical context? You don't. You can't. The Bible, you can. You can go to the places you can see what he said. You can uncover the mounds that are there. Here's the city. Here's the pottery. This is the date. This is the inscriptions of God. They found the oldest writings of God, not just the Dead Sea Scrolls, but 500 years earlier, they found little silver scrolls with the Lord, you know, um, his name on it, the, the Aaronic blessing, the Lord bless you uh, and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine at you. And little silver amulets rooted there, right outside Jerusalem. This is a historical account. This is not a Bible story. So John is going to give us a picture of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking in the water. But more than that, what are we going to learn from this? I call these the impossible moments with Jesus. And by the time we're through, I'm hoping that you can see some of the impossible things you face were ordained of God to show his power over the impossible. And whatever you're still holding on to in fear uh, or in doubt, that you'll say, okay, Lord, I, I'm going to fight, stop fighting you. I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to believe you truly are the son of God. You are alive. You, you died. You rose again. You have a purpose for my life. So verse 1, John 6 these things, after these things, after, after Jesus had done the previous miracle and answered some of the questions, he says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And when you go to, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, if your pastor ever does, 
it's exciting to do that simply because the Bible comes alive. We had a trip there, and when you hear about Jesus coming from Nazareth to Galilee, uh, you actually can sit on a cliff and look at the valley uh, as he would have come by the Arbel Cliffs down into the 613 feet below sea level. And then we go up on that cliff when we go and we look over that area, the northern uh, part of the Sea of Galilee, and that area is three quarters of where Jesus ministered. And then, of course, we took our group up there and I kind of point out some of these things. Uh, you, you can see a little bit of, of um, you know, the northern part of the, of the you know, Sea of Galilee. So this is where Jesus would have come now from you know, where he was, but instead of just stopping there, he actually goes over the Sea of Galilee on the other side, which was the land of the Gadarenes, and then even going up the Golan Heights, which uh, just recently was, uh, you, know, you know, in the last 50 years or so, you know, the Jewish people have controlled that area. And then we come to verse two, it says a great multitude followed him. So he's going across the sea, but a great multitude follow him. Now, now Mark's account, um, you know, it says multitudes saw them departing and they actually ran on foot around because Jesus had done so many things in the last few years. Verse two, he says, a great multitude followed him because they saw the signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And so Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near, so that's early mid-spring. He's up on the mountain with his disciples but we don't know, John doesn't go into details why he's there, but the other gospel account says that he'd been ministering so many times, people were following wherever, they never wanted him out of their sight, and he needed to get a break. They needed to take a break. So it basically says that Jesus, you know, Mark 6, 33, 34, basically says, multitudes saw them departing, ran there on foot, and then uh, he saw the multitude, he, he had compassion on them, so he began to teach them. So it was a long period of teaching, and then we come to where John interjects what was really important, because this, all this leads to a few impossible moments, and one of them is this, verse five, the rest of verse five, he says, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Again, the, the other gospels tell us it was after a long time of teaching, the other disciples were saying, please send them away, according to Mark 6. Uh, this is deserted. There's nothing around here. But send them away, Lord. They can go buy something to eat in the surrounding villages. But he told them, and Mark, uh, Mark's gospel records, he told them and says, you give them something to eat. So in John's gospel, we get more details. We, we find out it was specifically directed to Philip. Now, there are times when the Lord speaks to us through individuals and God, God is just he's signaling out Philip here for a reason. Uh, makes sense because the closest village to this place where they are down the mountain is Bethsaida. That was where Philip was from when you keep reading the Bible. By the way, every question you ever have about the Bible, you don't need some great scholar to answer. You just find it in the Bible. You keep reading. I, so many times people say, but pastor, what a, just keep reading. But this passage, just keep reading. But what is it? Just keep reading. The Bible will answer itself in every respect. You can become a Bible scholar by just keep reading. Comparing the Bible, the best commentary in the Bible is the Bible. That's what I share with pastors as well. But it makes sense Philip would be the guy here. And he would know the town. He would know how much food is there. And uh, this would really be a big test because... He's telling them, where are we going to find some uh, bread? Where can we buy some bread, Philip? You're, you know the area kind of thing. Uh, Philip was a very quiet but deep-thinking person. Um, in verse 6, it says, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. See, God knows he's got a plan, and this is a great lesson for us. Because every time the Lord has a high expectation, have you ever felt that you, God is expecting from you more than you can do? Come on, let's be honest. I mean, have you felt that? Like God, it seems he's, he's hard. It's, he wants more than I can give. I, I don't have the strength. I can't, I don't know what I'm doing. And he's putting Philip in this place. Where are we gonna find bread for all these people? Where can we buy bread? It's impossible uh, and and. 
And we're going to see Philip's response. See, if Philip had perfect faith, he would have replied something like, well, we have no need to buy bread, Jesus. After all, you're the son of God. You're greater than Moses, right, who fed the people in the wilderness with bread for 40 years. What's this few thousand for you? He could have answered that way. If he had greater faith, he might have said something like, wow, Jesus, you're the bread of life. We don't even need bread. Man shall not live by bread alone. But he has little faith. I don't know if that encourages you, but it does me. He doesn't need, you don't need great faith. You need to have your little faith put in our great God. This is the need for believers. So much of our lives is a test. And Jesus, anytime he expects something of you, or demands something of you, or moves you in an area that you think, I can't do this. Those impossible expectations are actually promises in disguise. See, when he asks you to do something you can't do, count that as a promise. Well, Lord, I, if you're calling me to go to New Jersey from California and plant a church among the place where it's called the graveyard of churches, Okay, I'll do it because I know you can do it. And if you give me 10 people to pour into, I'll be happy with that, to pour into them and make them the most well-loved people. But as I take a step of faith, then God multiplies it like I could have never imagined. So this is really about taking our little faith and trusting God has a plan. So much of our lives are like this. His faith, however, Philip's, that is, is developing just as ours, and so we can... Look at his answer. Philip answered in verse seven, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them should have a little. Philip's like, never mind where we buy bread. Where are we gonna get the money? We don't have 200 days wages. A denarii was a day's wage of a laborer. That's like eight months salary for the average person in Israel. We don't have that. I mean, maybe he just had a board meeting and realized funds are pretty low because the man controlling the treasury was Judas, and we find out later he was stealing from the treasury because he, he was a carnal, evil man. He looked spiritual on the outside, but he was a thief. So he could probably said, well, the funds are really low, and Philip's thinking, okay, well, what can we do? We don't have the money. He's focused on what can't be done. I, I, I don't know, but I, I don't recall Jesus asking what can't be done but what can be done? And we often focus on, oh, it can't be done. I love the fact that Philip, unlike the other disciples, at least they're saying, send them away, send them away. Philip's trying to figure this out. He's working through it. So it's a good thing. You know, we're not gonna get it right perfectly, but when we are teachable, okay, Lord, what are you trying to do here? Look, I've learned so many times just to get out of the Lord's way. I remember just a young intern in California. We were making very, very little money, just enough to survive. And um, we had gotten to the store. We got our groceries, put them in the refrigerator. We were very happy. You know, okay, we're all set for a while. And woke up the next morning and found the refrigerator was broken. And I was a little frustrated with God. You know, God, why are you doing this? It's your money, it's your food. Why are you doing this to us? You know, what are we gonna do? And I was annoyed. I'm out here serving you, Lord. I could be making a lot more money over there and I'm here I'm sacrificing and look, this is what you do. So I'm having a little argument with God and you know, how God answers you is pretty much how he answers everybody, right? Silence. I got no response. So we fixed our refrigerator, we got scraped together, got a little more food put in it. And two weeks later, it broke again. Now this time, I learned a lesson. Apparently, I didn't learn it the first time. And the problem with that is if you don't learn the lesson the first time, you're gonna have to learn it again. So now I'm in the same boat. So this time I go, okay, Lord, I, I surrender. I don't know what you want to do. It's your refrigerator. It's your food. Thank you, Jesus. You know, you've got a plan. I just trust you're going to take care of it, and I thank you in advance for the answer. And within an hour, this has really happened, uh, we had promised a lady that she could store her things in our garage while she was moving, and uh, her truck drove up, 
in the truck was a refrigerator and I asked if I could borrow it for a few minutes or for a few days until we got ours fixed. And she says, you know, it's an old refrigerator, works great, you can have it. We got a refrigerator within an hour. And I learned something about Thanksgiving. If you wanna express faith in God, that's the best way to do it. Because what we see is impossible, we can't figure it out and we tend to complain and get frustrated if we'd stop that nonsense and just learn to say, God, you know your bigger plan, I have no idea, but I'm gonna thank you in advance because I know you have a plan. We'd see him, you see, God is looking throughout the whole earth, the Bible says, Second Chronicles 20, seeking to find a heart who's loyal to him, who trusts him, that he might show his power upon them. God wants to use you. He wants to do something in you. If you're looking for an easy, comfortable life, you're in the wrong place because God is gonna disrupt your life in many ways so that you learn how to trust in him so that you can then help others and you're now investing in souls which are eternal because long after this entire world is dust, that soul out there in the streets of Eldoret all over Af Africa, all over the world, that one little soul, little child, old person, that one soul is worth more than the entire universe because that soul is eternal. That soul will live forever, long after everything is dust. I can't think of a better place to put my investment than in the souls of people. So these are lessons that the disciples are learning. Now, Andrew is another disciple in verse eight. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Now again, the disciple, the gospel accounts all cover the feeding of the 5,000, but only John points out it was Andrew and it was Philip that were close to the situation. And here where Philip's trying to figure it out, Andrew has this wild idea uh, to just bring a boy with a lunch and say, hey, he's a guy with five loaves and two little fish. Don't think of a big loaf of bread. Think of probably a little chipata, a little tiny, little, little tiny, a little biscuit maybe. I don't know. It, wasn't, it was a boy's lunch. It wasn't a big, huge fish. It was probably sardine. A couple of sardines, dried, pickled, by the way, history tells us the Romans settled in that area of Galilee because they loved the salted fish of that area. It was, it was a vacation spot of the world. It's beautiful climate. And so this boy brings his little lunch, and I, I love this. He adds, verse 9, but what are they among so many? Now, at least he's got a little bit of a faith there that, like, can you do something with this lunch, Jesus? You know, Philip, he may have been headed on the committee with Philip. You know, sometimes what happens is when you get a committee of people to try to solve a problem, uh, a committee is a group of people that individually can do nothing, but together can decide that nothing can be done. So that's what a committee is. I, I say a committee has a special bus. Their special bus is built for committees. It's got three brakes and five steering wheels. Uh, that's what you get when you get a bunch of people trying to solve the problem. You know, hey, we got a fish here. We got, oh, can we do this? But here's the wild thing. Andrew and Philip are not alone. We, we, we struggle in the same way, but also even Moses. Remember Moses, I mean, look, he saw the plagues of Egypt come down on Pharaoh. He saw them rescue them across the Red Sea. Then Water comes out of a rock to satisfy their thirst. God speaks from heaven. Manna comes from heaven to provide them. In fact, people are gonna be comparing what Jesus does here with what Moses did. And they're gonna get a bigger vision of Jesus when this is all done. But Moses had another problem. You see, this is always the funny thing. You know, you, you know those times when God worked in your life. He answered a prayer. He moved powerfully. Wow, God was there. His sense of his presence was so amazing. But then a month goes by and you forget. You come into another trial and you fall apart. So Moses, after seeing all those miracles, 
The people are complaining, I want meat, we're tired of this bread, it's horrible, you know, I mean, we're tired of it every day, manna this, manna burgers, manna kadi, you know, all the manna, it's got to be something better. Well, so Moses goes to God and says, I can't handle these people. Numbers 11 accounts this, it's pretty powerful. Uh, it's, it's one of the funniest chapters because Moses goes to God and God says, we'll give him some meat. And Moses says, we should, in Numbers 22, verse 11, verse 22, he says, all the flocks and herds, if they were slaughtered for them to provide enough for them, how could they, or all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses, and listen carefully, has the Lord's arm been shortened? So Andrew, you know, this is a great picture. By the way, Sarah also had her struggles when she heard the angel say that, or the Lord say that she was going to be giving birth at age of 90. And uh, she said, <laughs> she laughed, how can I bear a child when I'm old? And verse 14 of Genesis 18 says, says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? So Andrew brings him what he has. He works within our limitations as well. And he multiplies the effort. Some think impossible. Others think, well, let's just take a step forward. Every venture of faith we've done, and I mean venture, not presumption. See, you can be presumptuous. I want to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim it by faith. I decree faith. You know, we can play those little games. That's not faith. That's mind games. That's your own little belief thing. And it's almost paganism where you can create reality with your thinking. That is not faith. Faith is responding to God's leading. So when you sense him leading in a way, you take a step forward and you see what he does. If a door is closed, sometimes you persist, you keep going forward until you sense, okay, I don't have peace, I'm striving, I'm gonna trust the Lord in this. Let's see what else he does. So you kind of follow, you wanna follow Jesus. You don't wanna get out there and say, this is what I wanna do, God bless it. That is not faith. So, this is a great lesson. Um, there's nobody who knows what's going on except for Jesus. Remember, he himself knew what he would do. He's testing the disciples, where shall we buy bread? But he himself knew what he was going to do. And that, that's a very important point for us. The question, where shall we buy bread, was meant for us because it's comforting to know the Lord knows. My go-to phrase in so many, I don't think there's a day that goes by I don't say this. Because not a day goes by without some challenge or some closed door or something that happens or why did I get word for this? And, you know, on this trip, my 13-year-old grandson, very excited, and he's over there in Uganda and he's, 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 he's watching this stuff happen and um, I'm praying God do something in him powerfully on this trip. And uh, he's playing basketball. He's like sitting in the sessions with the pastors but then he got a fever. He started feeling really bad. He was burning up last night. He's lying alone in bed in the hotel right now, and I got him plenty of food and medicine and everything he needs, and do not disturb sign, and just trusting he'll be fine. But, oh, it breaks my heart to see that, and all I can say is, well, the Lord knows. It's not what I would have planned for him. He was even wondering, why is this happening to me? And I had a talk with him last night. The Lord knows, honey. I say that all the time because I don't know. I don't want to pretend I know. But he knows. The Lord knows. In fact, uh, on this trip, I left a young lady uh, in her late 30s, five children. She's in the hospital. Her husband, we've been talking, regularly praying. He was beside himself. The doctors were losing her. They didn't know what was wrong with her. They were, her blood pressure's going down, her heart rate, everything. They're losing her and they don't know why. And he's so afraid he's going to lose his wife. And I had to talk him off the ledge and encourage him. Hey, the Lord knows. Let's, let's pray. Let's commit this to the Lord. And the Lord began to answer because a young nurse in our church who knew her condition seven years before she had a similar thing, she, she suspected something else. And so she went to see these specialist doctors in this big hospital and 
And they looked at her like, you don't know what you're talking about. We're the experts. But she kept saying, you know, I, I think this could be a vitamin D, B or a C deficiency because uh, she doesn't eat, because she, she knew the patient. She doesn't eat citrus. She, just, she hates citrus fruit. And it could be low vitamin C. Oh, that can't be, that can't be. You know, and they wouldn't listen. So we, had to, we got to get everybody praying, Lord, I pray that you humble those doctors. They think they know everything. Help them at least test this because they don't know what to do. And finally they said, you know, we don't know what to do. We might as well try it. So they tested her for vitamin C. Extremely low. They discovered she had scurvy, which is a rare disease that used to happen to sailors where they'd go on these long trips with no, no vitamin C and they'd die from it. And... Again, give her vitamin C within three days. She was up and around, out of the hospital, doing better. Sometimes it's just the Lord knows. What do we do? Pray for her. Her name is Amanda, by the way. But prayer, uh, when we come to the Lord and we're trying to sort out what's going on, prayer is not meant to instruct God. Okay, God, now if you just have the bank call me at this time and we have the funds come in and we do this, we sometimes try to tell God what to do in prayer. Don't do that. Or sometimes we try to inform God about the situation. Now, I don't know, Lord, but the bank is this and they, they said this and, and they're, you're trying to tell God, yeah, he already knows. The Lord knows. Just get to the point. Lord, we have no bread. We pray that you provide. Well, uh, th to me, this is really what ministry is. So Andrew brings this little boy with, with the loaves and, and the Lord knows what he's gonna do. And I gotta tell you that one of the lessons in life for me and one of the truths of life with the Lord is you've gotta view it this way where we bring our loaves and fishes to the Lord and we expect him to multiply. We trust him to multiply because all we really have, the best of us, is really just loaves and fishes. I mean, we can get our music team together and we get some good music going. We can organize and get the information out there and have the banners going. We have the announcements. We can have people doing the greeting. We have people that are giving the message. We have the, you know, afterwards, uh, the fellowship time. And all this is, you know, the ushers are ushing and the deacons are deacon and the elders are elding and all of everyone's doing their part. But all the sum of the parts add up to something more than we could ever because the Lord takes those little loaves and fishes and he supernaturally ministers. You know, when I get up in the pulpit, I, I have a message. I've, I've studied. I've looked at the scriptures. I've compared the scriptures. I've, I've organized it. I've outlined it. And I think I understand this. But then when I get up, I go, Lord, you're God. You know who's here. You know what they're going through. You know the mother that's struggling with a young sick child. You know the, the person who's struggling with getting work and not pay, having enough to feed his family or the news that person got cancer. You know every struggle in this room. I don't know, but you know. So here we are. We've got our loaves and fishes. We've made the service available and we have no illusion that we can do anything. We're offering it to the Lord. Let's see what he does. He might be already speaking to some of you. Thinking like, wow, the pastor went there and I, this is exactly what I needed. I don't know that, but he knows that. You know, we just bring our loaves and fishes and the miracle of salvation. Some of you maybe came in here, was a, a visiting, maybe a friend that, that brought you here. Maybe you just walking by the street. I met a young man today in first service who just came in, saw something going on, came in, sat there, I think the message was for him. And I do believe that God has that kind of plan always in place. So this little boy willing to give his lunch up, and, and I hope young people listen to me. You have little in your mind, but bring it to Jesus. Maybe nobody takes you serious, but bring it to Jesus. Yield yourself to him. Don't get stuck in your plan. Pray. Ask the Lord. Maybe you're single, you're feeling lonely, and your friends are all married. And you're like, Lord, what is going on? I, I learned when I was in that place, it was always like, Lord, bring me a wife. And the Lord kind of told me, you know, I've, I've got these precious gems, and, you know, I, if you're willing to follow me, I'll, uh, you, you'll, I'll take care of that. Trust me. Stop worrying about that. Just do what you, I'm calling you to do. And so I just began to be a brother to my sisters and serve the Lord. 
And the Lord amazingly snuck up on me with a wife that's, well, the last 44 years, it'll be 44 years in March we're married, and it gets better every year. It's something that only the Lord can do. So here's what the Lord does. He's basically, in verse 10, says, make the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now, I just have to ask you a question. Just Sometimes we read these little phrases. Now, there was much grass in the place. So what? Why does he tell us that? You see, anytime you see something in the Bible that you wonder why he says that, what's the point of that? Why is he giving the genealogy and why is he saying this and all these other things that seem to be like, well, I just want, just give me something to live on today. That there was much grass in the place, I don't care. But those things are very special because the Bible is an accurate record of what happened. If it's accurate, it's going to fit. With the geography, it's going to fit. With the archaeology, it's going to fit. Well, the fact that there's much grass in the place, remember earlier he said it was around Passover, which is early mid-spring? If you're up in the Golan Heights, the only time there's grass is in early spring, in mid-spring. That's when they take the cows up there. They're called the cows of Bashan. They, uh, there's nothing else that grows up there hardly, but the grass will flourish for a little bit, and then it dries up in the sun, then it's gone. So it's just a little insight that whoever wrote this must have been there. They couldn't, you can't make up a story and keep these kinds of details if you're ignorant of the time. That's why when the Quran was written hundreds of years after, G, that Muhammad lived, we don't really know anything. How do you know? They weren't around to say whether this was happened. They heard some stories that passed down, but no, we have records. So he sits them down in groups. In verse 11, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, well, 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 well before the miracle, giving thanks. Listen. Anybody can thank God after the miracle comes. But it takes faith to thank him in advance, which is why that was a lesson I've learned. And by the way, I've learned that I can't afford to not thank him when I'm in a trial because I don't want to learn the lesson again. I'm going to, okay, Lord, I surrender. You've got a plan. And I got to tell you, so many amazing things happened as a miss a flight here, this happens there, this disaster here. You know, we've had our own tragedy, you know, the loss of our son uh, about three, four, three and a half years ago. Four years, it'll be in April. And those are things that, again, the Lord knows. But I was so thankful the Lord brought my son back to the Lord. I was so thankful God did a work in his heart. And I'd hoped he'd be in the pulpit. Pastor friend of mine told me, Lloyd, he is in the pulpit. And I have to realize a lot of who I am is the result of those 20 years of working through his being angry with God, being a prodigal, patience, praying on our face, crying out to God. That made me who I am. And I'm ever grateful for that pain now. And I'm thankful the Lord has safely tucked my son away in heaven because he had a lot of physical problems. And I trust him again. Look, this is now, the Lord is going to do something here. He gave thanks. He distributed them to the disciples. The disciples then distributed to those sitting down, likewise to the fish, as much as they wanted. Way beyond Philip's figures. So they were all filled, verse 12 says, and he said to his disciples, go gather the fragments that remain so nothing is lost. He's not a wasteful God. In fact, we need to learn that don't think the little days, the little things are nothing. Don't take for granted what you have. Be thankful for what you have and pray that God would use your life to be a blessing to others. In fact, that's a great lesson in this as well. As that boy brought his lunch, you know, I, I find that just like the widow that Elisha said, Make me, what do you have in the house? I've got a little jar of oil, a little bit of bread. And I'm gonna make a piece of bread and we're gonna, my son and I will eat it and they're gonna die because we have nothing else. And Elisha says, 
well, go ahead and make that bread, but give it to me. And, you, and your oil and your bread will never run out. And you know, that's a powerful lesson, just like this is a lesson. It's, if I live my life for myself, I will find myself empty. But if I forget about myself, and I think life is too short to worry about my pains and aches and problems, I want to help others. I will tell you, you will find your problems disappear when you start thinking of others, when you start baking bread for others, not worrying whether you don't have anything to eat. God will always supply. It's a great lesson. I was talking to some of the children, uh, Pastor Josh and Kelsey, uh, with the Pilgrim's Progress book they had, and one of my favorite stories in that is when Christian goes into the house of interpreter and as he goes in, he sees this wall and there's this big fire that's burning up against the wall but a man's grabbing buckets of water and he's throwing the water on the fire. Instead, the fire's getting bigger. And they're like, wow, what does this mean? And interpreter took him around the back of the wall and there was a man pouring oil on the fire secretly. That's our life. That fire is your being on fire for God. And the world is trying to pour water on you, destroy you, intimidate you, make you not believe, make you think that your life is over, you're nobody, you've got nothing. But when you believe in God, he provides a secret supply of power and anointing that will keep that fire going in the midst of a huge flood. What, this is our God. So now they've got all this stuff, all this these filled, they pick up all these baskets, satisfied. You see, God doesn't need some wealthy benefactor. In fact, God convicted me when we were trying to build a building and get a radio station going in our school. I'm like, Lord, it'd be nice if you sent us a few wealthy people. I know there's not many that follow you that are wealthy, but there's some, so we could use a few. And the Lord reminded me, I want to build this place with ordinary people and ordinary giving with ordinary gifts that I can supernaturally touch so that nobody gets the glory. Okay, Lord, I'm in. That's the key. See, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's enough that he can take our broken hearts, our our broken pots, our brokenness to the Lord and fill us because this is really what it comes down to. You know, broken clouds give rain. Broken seed receives the, uh, broken soil receives the seed. Broken seed gives life. Broken stalk brings the harvest. Broken shell on that wheat brings life-giving food. There's a secret of brokenness in the Christian life and Jesus modeled that for us. He laid his life down. His body was broken for us in our communion. This is a powerful thing to know. Well, the world has abandoned brokenness, but we know brokenness is key because it'll keep us at the feet of Jesus. And verse 14 then says, those men, when they had seen the sign Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who's come into the world. And... The response is now they realize he's like Jesus. He's like Moses who fed us. And if you really want to have fun to compare Moses and Jesus, you can go to oneforisrael.org. There's an article there that compares is Yeshua really the prophet like Moses. And there's like 21 illustrations we wouldn't have time to go into. But I want to get to the close of this because in verse 15, you know, after he did this miracle and they say, this is that prophet, they're amazed, but they have their own agenda. Don't do this. They, 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 Jesus perceived they're about to come and take him by force to make him king. He departed from, to the mountain by himself alone. He would not be used by them. See, there are people that want to use Jesus for their purposes. They want to use religion to get what they want. The Lord will not honor that. Jesus then reveals himself more to the disciples because when he goes back up the mountain, they get down to the boat. It says in the evening, they went down to the sea, got into the boat, went over the sea toward Capernaum. 
When it was already dark, Jesus had not come. The sea arose because of a great wind which happens on the Sea of Galilee. That's another historical fact. I was on the sea in a boat like you saw earlier and calm as anything when we went out of the boat and then wind started up and that little thing churned so much water was coming over the side and that boat is a lot bigger than the boat Jesus was in or the disciples were in. So they're rowing, they're fighting the wind. Verse 19, they saw Jesus walking in the sea and drawing near the boat and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. They willingly then received him into the boat. Immediately the boat was at the land they were going. And I end with this, the impossible moments with Jesus. Do you know my Jesus? Do you know him? I'm gonna invite the worship team to come up. I, I don't sure the time is. I had my silent timer here and I don't know whether it stopped or what happened, but um, I really believe that there are some here that you need to make that decision to say, okay, Lord, I'm, star- I'm tired of fighting you. I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna believe what you did for me by going to the cross because that's ultimately the biggest act of Jesus, the biggest sign that he'd be three days in the heart of the earth but then we'd be raised up on the third day like Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish. There's nothing that can stop my Jesus. There's nothing that can take away the value of your soul and Jesus, his name is Jesus because he will save us from our because he values your soul, he, he laid his life down. Will you trust my Jesus? Let's praise him.